Welcome to the Libre Quest podcast. My name is Matt. This is episode 46. Today I'm joined by Dr. Ian Thompson, who has been involved in Choctaw traditional culture since he was a child and who is currently serving as the Choctaw Nation's Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. He's going to be speaking today about Choctaw history and land restoration and preservation, as well as some other topics related to traditional Choctaw natural plant knowledge. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Matt. It's an honor to, to join you and get to talk about a, a topic that's really interesting to me. It's something that I'm passionate about. Absolutely. So, well, thank, thank you for being here. And you can uh, begin your presentation as soon as you're ready. Okay. I'll go ahead and start now then. The, the presentation that I'm, I'm going to talk about today is Choctaw Plant Knowledge, a 21st Century Experiment. Today, you know, a lot of times we think about Choctaw culture, traditional culture, indigenous culture from groups all over the world as being something that's of the past. And, you know, certainly it does have deep roots. It's, it's tied to our ancestors' heritage with the land. But less often do people think about traditional culture as something that's present day or as something that can be created or revitalized or something that may be extremely pertinent to the future quality of life of people on this planet. This presentation looks at some of those aspects of traditional knowledge. You know, many of the challenges that humanity faces now and will be increasingly facing in the future has to do with our relationship with the land, with the earth. The earth has supported humanity since time immemorial. You know, through a vast expanse of time, humanity lived in indigenous communities all over the globe. You know, if you're human, then you are descended from indigenous ancestors. And by that, I mean people who lived in societies that were tied long-term to local landscapes. They got everything that they needed to live from the local landscape around them. As time passed, human society, some societies, changed their way of living. They became less indigenous. Um, they became more focused on global networks, global economics, colonization, things like that. And ultimately, this has led us to a place where humanity no longer gets most of the things that we need from the local landscapes around us. Basically, this is a core part of the lack of sustainability that human society has now. You know, it's gotten to a point through degradation of the soils, degradation of natural habitats, climate change caused by burning fossil fuels, that our relationship with the earth is threatening our own future quality of life, maybe our own future existence. I believe that one of the aspects, one of many aspects that traditional culture has that can be of value to people today is by looking at exactly what an indigenous relationship with the land looks like, these types of relationships that were sustainable for hundreds, thousands of years, and these types of relationships that all of our ancestors at one point in time had with the land. Today, I'm, I'm going to be talking especially about the plant aspect of indigenous Choctaw landscape knowledge, but it really ties in with, with other things too, with all other aspects of the animal life, the water, the soil, the air, all of that. I remember when I was a, a child, my parents took me on a, a trip to the southeast and I got to go through areas of the Choctaw homeland. And I was really impressed by the amount of plant growth that was down there. You know, if you drive along the highway there, in a lot of places, it's just this dense mat of vegetation. You know, they're pretty tall trees, but then there's all this undergrowth and the sunlight doesn't really even hit the soil there in a lot of places. And I remember thinking back at that time, you know, how tough our ancestors must have been to live in an environment like that. As time passed, you know, what impressed me shifted a little bit from not that our ancestors were able to live in that environment, but in fact that they created an environment that was much easier to live in, much more conducive to a high quality of life. So basically, the type of environment that you see in most places in the Choctaw homeland, most places in this country, most places in the world, is not how it looked when indigenous people managed the land. And you can start to see some of this when you look at the accounts of early Euro-Americans who visited and ultimately colonized the Choctaw homeland. One of the most significant statements that they left was um, something written by Eugene Hilgard. Eugene Hilgard was the father of modern soil science, you know, a father of geology. And he came to the Choctaw homeland in the 1850s or so, and he wrote this just shortly after. This, the 1850s, of course, was after the first part of the Choctaw Trail of Tears. So most Choctaw people, not all, but most Choctaw people 
had left for Indian territory. And at this point, the point at which he wrote, the land was being managed by colonizers. What he said was, well might the Chickasaws and Choctaws question the moral right of the act by which the beautiful park-like hunting grounds were turned over to another race. Under their system, these lands would have lasted forever. Under ours, as heretofore practiced, in less than a century, more less than a century more, the state would be reduced to the condition of the Roman Campagna. And so from this statement, we see several things. You know, the first thing, the most important thing to me is that he's talking about the Choctaws had a system for land management. So that says that, you know, this wasn't just living in paradise. This wasn't just, you know, an ecological Indian kind of paradigm, but it's, they had to actively manage the land to create what they wanted for the life space around them. <clears throat> we also see from this statement that the father of modern soil science considered the Choctaw and Chickasaw system of land management to be infinitely sustainable. We also see that he considered the type of farming practice that was being done by a colonial society at that time was not sustainable. And keep in mind that this is a time, <clears throat> this is a time when, you know, there were no genetically modified organisms. There, there was no, pesticides, you know, many of the things that we associate with a lack of sustainability today were not being done by colonial farmers at that time. You know, the colonial farmers at that time were doing many practices that we would consider sustainable. But actually, in the broader scheme of things, they were not, especially compared to the indigenous system of land management that had existed there before. Another quote that I'll go to is by Gideon Lincecum. And Gideon Lincecum is a person who moved into Choctaw country in the 1820s and he got to know Choctaw people and, and Chickasaw people became friends, you know, ad, came to admire the Choctaw Chickasaw way of doing things. And he was present when the treaty of dancing rabbit Creek was signed. He was present when the trail of tears happened and he was present when many of his countrymen moved in and colonized the area. And what he wrote was the locality was soon overrun and cut down by a race of world spoilers. And again, he's talking about his own countrymen there, but he had come to understand at least something about the land through Choctaw eyes. If you look at this time period, <clears throat> you know, European farming practices were set up across Choctaw country. And <clears throat> part of this involved um, taking out old growth forests so that they could be planted and involved plowing up the prairies. It involved feeding livestock on the river cane breaks. Um, and you can see that today in terms of pond sediments. Pond sediments basically accumulate at the bottom of still waters, and they trap plant materials, resilient plant materials, things like pollen, that travel through the air and settle in the ponds. If you look at the pond sediments from the Choctaw homeland dating to the 1840s, you see a, a big shift in the types of plant pollen that existed there. So... One of the plants, if you see on the landscape, and we'll talk about it more, but one of the plants that indicates disturbance across the landscape is ragweed. You know, when, when grass and more conservative species are damaged through overgrazing or plowing, something like that, ragweed is one of the plants that moves in and colonizes the soil. It stabilizes it. If you look at those pollen profiles from the Choctaw homeland, you see an explosion in ragweed pollen in the 1840s. That means that the whole landscape was a landscape of disturbance and erosion. And that, that is exactly what you would expect from reading these accounts from Eugene Hillgard and Gideon Lincecum. The area was cut over, it was plowed through, and traditional practices were stopped. You know, basically, it was an ecological disaster. They didn't think of it in terms of that. They thought of it in terms, most people thought of it in terms of civilizing the land. But Choctaw saw it differently, and so did Lincecum, so did the father of modern soil science. They saw it as something that was not sustainable and something that degraded quality of life there from what Choctaw people had maintained for thousands of years. If you step back farther in time, you know, the, the landscape that I, I saw as a, a child that I was impressed how our ancestors could live in such a dense mat of vegetation. If you step back farther in time there, that particular locality was actually a longleaf pine forest. Longleaf pine forest is called Tiak Faya in the Choctaw language. And basically, the southern longleaf pine forest is a group of native pine trees growing in a tall grass prairie environment. You know, these pine trees 
would become old growth in some areas. Some areas they'd be at, I think, like 100 feet to the first branch. The tree trunks were massive. But even so, it was an open canopy environment, which allowed the light to hit the soil underneath the trees. And this led to the second highest level of plant diversity outside of the tropics. You know, it was an amazing landscape for living comfortably, for providing the food that people needed there underneath the trees and the land, and for attracting a variety of animals. This was the open park-like hunting ground, at least part of it, that Eugene Hilgord spoke about. Some areas they're working to restore the longleaf pine forest. Um, Choctaw Nation partners with some of Mississippi National Forest, particularly DeSoto National Forest each year, and we take a group of Choctaw youth down to these areas where the land managers are trying to reestablish the type of land management practices that Choctaws and other indigenous people in the Southeast followed in order to restore the longleaf pine forest, the tall grass prairie, the open upland woods and the bottomland forests. And it, it's just an amazing place. It's so different from what you see by the roadsides. I mean, you, you can see how people could live and thrive in this type of environment for thousands of years. And the way that they do that is, you know, they, First, if the area has been completely logged over, they'll go through and they'll seed it with the native species. And then they introduce it to a fire regime. They burn it about every three years or so. And that's what that landscape has adapted to over 10,000 years of management by our ancestors and others. So those are the plants that are adapted to that area. And when they follow those protocols and some others, you see this beautiful landscape reemerge just like it used to be there a couple hundred years ago. It's not old growth forest yet, but other than that, it's just like it was a long time ago. The longleaf pine forest, you know, it's kind of what I've been focusing on because that, that's an area that I saw as a child, a place that used to be longleaf pine forest. But it's just one of the ecosystems of the Choctaw homeland. The Choctaw homeland encompasses a, a large area that <clears throat> includes a big part of western Alabama and a big part of eastern Mississippi going down to the coast. In this area, Choctaw people and societies managed and relied on each of these different types of ecosystems in order to have a high quality of life. Right on the coast, of course, were the beaches. Going just north from that, just inland from that, was the longleaf pine forest we've been discussing. Going a little bit farther north from that was an open mixed woodland forest. But also, a lot of people don't think about this, there were large areas of prairie in the Choctaw homeland. There's the Jackson Prairie, um, just north of the Longleaf Pine Forest, and then there's the much bigger Black Belt Prairie that occurs in an arc from northeastern Mississippi down to the Alabama-Mississippi line, about the central parts of the state, and then over into central Alabama. This Black Belt Prairie is called Oktok in the Choctaw language, and it's really important culturally. One of the earliest Choctaw oral stories that we have is about the creation of the Black Belt Prairie. Now, with oral histories, they don't have they don't have dates in them, but they do have they do describe events that are datable. This Choctaw oral story talks about a time not long after Choctaws emerged at Naniwaya, when there were giant animals that lived in the area that are not that were not like anything living today. They lived in herds, and they came through particularly concentrated in the Black Belt Prairie area, and they would eat off the bark of the trees and they were big enough they could eat off the lower branches of the trees and th basically they girdled the trees and killed them and this helped to foster a grassland community there at the black belt prairie according to there are two different versions of this choctaw oral story according to one of the versions the animals eventually died off as a result of an introduced disease and if you look at this story it it corresponds really well with the archaeology's understanding of the pleistocene megafauna the Pleistocene megafauna is a term that refers to giant animals that lived in North America and elsewhere around the world during the last glacial maximum. You know, its, its center was 18,000 years ago, but they lived long before that, some of them. And at the end of the last glacial maximum, the climate changed rapidly. Most of these animals either went extinct or moved to different areas. Uh, an example of an animal that went extinct would be the copy would be the glyptodon. You know, the glyptodon was an armadillo-like creature about the size of a Volkswagen beetle. An example of an animal that moved would be the American bison. You know, it moved from the eastern United States out onto the Great Plains. That event is datable. 
you know, that happened about 11,000 years ago in the Choctaw homeland. So we know that Choctaw people not only have been in the homeland for that long, but we know that Choctaw culture has been connected with prairie areas for that long, along with wooded areas. There are other accounts from Choctaw oral history about different things happening on the Black Belt Prairie, um, different things that were significant in our culture. Our ancestors managed those prairie areas. Um, it wasn't just the fact that Pleistocene megafauna had lived in those areas and killed trees. The areas were also underlined by chalky soils that helped to prevent trees from growing there. But in addition to that, our ancestors regularly set fire to those prairies in order to reset ecological succession. By doing that, they expanded the prairies, they expanded the grasslands, um, they favored all types of native plants that were useful for food and other purposes, and they also encouraged game animals to come there during some parts of the year. So although we don't really think about prairie as being connected with Choctaw culture, it really is. It's deeply connected with Choctaw culture. And the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the Choctaw relationship with the prairie and taking that forward to today. When Choctaw people went on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma, they encountered another tall grass prairie. There's a, a band of tall grass prairie that stretches all the way from southern Texas up into Canada. And it goes sort of along the Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska lines and, and up from there. At one time, it covered millions and millions of acres. And part of the area that it covered was here in southeastern Oklahoma, Indian Territory, you know, where Choctaws came on the Trail of Tears. The area around Durant, Oklahoma, you know, Durant's today's Choctaw Nation headquarters. It's the seat of government for the most part. Well, I should say many aspects of Choctaw government are seated here. But this area on down to Sherman, Texas, was once one of the most productive grasslands in the country. Records from the late 1800s talk about Sherman, Texas being the top exporter of hay in the country. And that's because of the rich tall grass prairie that existed here. The tall grass prairie that exists here is a little bit different from the ones in the Choctaw homeland in that it, it doesn't exist because it's underlined by rock or other reasons. It exists because there's less rain here. The rain is low enough here. Um, fires come through frequently enough that this area is tall grass prairie because of those environmental factors. And also because people, the natives who lived here before Choctaws came, the ancestors of the Caddo and Quapaw and other tribes, regularly burn this landscape to help foster the prairie, just as our ancestors did in their homeland. And you can see prairie um, and its connections with Choctaw culture in Oklahoma. For example, one of the oldest Choctaw churches in this area, which unfortunately burned down a few years ago, was Tshoktok. And Tshoktok means post oak prairie in the Choctaw language. Um, there are place names that refer to buffalo or bison, you know, like Buffalo Valley, Oklahoma, would be one example. Yanish would be another example. Yanish means bison in the Choctaw language. There are lots of accounts of our of the Choctaw people in Oklahoma taking advantage of that prairie environment. However, colonization followed Choctaw people west, of course. So we talked about earlier the, the ecological disaster that occurred in the Choctaw homeland. And that, that, by the way, was connected with the extinction of something like 150 different species, mostly of animals, some plants too. That same type of relationship with the land, that same colonization of the land, followed Choctaw people west. In the early 1900s, Choctaw lands in what's now Oklahoma were broken up through an allotment process, and the Choctaw tribal government was dissolved, at least as a representative democracy entity, although it, it did still exist in a way with the, the chief appointed by the United States president. In the 1920s, um, the federal government encouraged Choctaw allotment holders to lease out their lands to sharecroppers. In that time, the 1920s, southeastern Oklahoma had a higher incidence of sharecropping than any other place in the country, is my understanding. And the sharecroppers that came in, they didn't necessarily respect Choctaw people. They didn't necessarily respect the land in this area. So they focused their techniques only on maximizing production. And this caused, basically, they mined out the soil through agriculture. Um, much as in Mississippi, they also did farming practices that eroded the soil away. 
10 years later, the same practices would lead to the Dust Bowl a little bit west of here. But this, this drastically changed the soil in southeastern Oklahoma. There are accounts from Choctaw people who lived at this time that talk about pastures that, or they talk about land that once was fertile enough to support tobacco and corn, losing fertility at such a, a rapid rate that within just a few years it became suitable only for rangeland. You know, its, its fertility was gone. So there are some places like, you know, one of the things that I do for Choctaw Nation is I'm part of a, a group that goes out and does archaeological surveys when Choctaw Nation is putting in construction projects or homes for families, water lines, that kind of thing. One of the things that we do for those surveys is we do systematic shovel testing. Uh, we'll dig shovel tests on a grid and screen through the soil to see if there are any artifacts or any evidence that people use that landscape in the past that would suggest that we should you know, try to protect it. I've dug shovel tests all over Choctaw Nation, and in most places, the topsoil is only a couple inches deep. But there are two places I've been to where it's very different. One of those is actually here around the Choctaw Nation Cultural Center. There's a 100-plus acre remnant native prairie that's still here from back in the old days. And for whatever reason, it, it's never been plowed. It's still covered in the prairie sod. And if you dig shovel tests through that, it's black, beautiful topsoil down about three feet. And there, there's one other spot that I've seen that was like that as well. So to me, that gives some idea of what the soils were like, maybe not everywhere across Choctaw Nation, but definitely in some places before the sharecropping event happened, uh, before the soils were eroded. Eroding out that soil is, is significant. You know, obviously, it leads to different types of plant communities. It makes it harder to do agriculture. Um, I, I forget the exact figures, but worldwide, the erosion of topsoil uh, up into the air is a major contributor to climate change. It's a major contributor to the siltification of rivers. Um, that and agricultural runoff lead to a hypoxic dead zone the size of Connecticut that occurs in the Gulf Coast at the mouth of the Mississippi River every summer. So these are major, major ecological impacts here that ultimately they do now and they're going to impact human quality of life even more in the future. So this is a point where it looks like maybe there are some things that we can learn from from indigenous culture. And as I said, everybody, you know, even the even the descendants of colonizers, everybody has indigenous ancestors who at one point in time had to live sustainably with the land around them that supported them because their societies were locally focused. So <clears throat> this is a we kind of saw this as an opportunity to see what Choctaw traditional landscape-based knowledge, how it could be adapted in our current situation in southeastern Oklahoma, where the, the land's eroded and no longer is able to support life as it used to. So my wife and I decided to purchase a farm and to implement some of these Choctaw land management practices. Really, I should back up. We decided to, to purchase an acreage and to use it to set up a farm and the goals of that farm were to support Choctaw traditional knowledge, to support the Choctaw community, and to produce healthy food, and to restore the land. So we chose to do that as much as possible using Choctaw traditional culture, but also places where it overlaps with other aspects of sustainable agriculture to absolutely learn from those other techniques and apply them to the land as well. We looked for a suitable piece of land for... A little while, uh, we put together a list of all the criteria that we wanted it to have that we felt would make it a successful experiment. We ended up purchasing a 160-acre farm uh, near the town of Ferris, Oklahoma. And this farm, you know, it measures, it's all contiguous, it measures half a mile by half a mile. And it's got 120 feet of elevation change. Uh, it's pretty special because it has these natural sandy seeps on it, which are kind of an an important and unusual ecological habitat. But when we bought it, the land, like most of southeastern Oklahoma, had just been mined out of its fertility. Um, for years, probably for decades, there'd been cattle run on it that had just completely changed the landscape and the native plants that were growing there. So in order to be successful, the first thing that we had to do was to try to begin restoring the land and the plant communities that existed there. When animals like animals grazing, that, that's part of the, the natural cycle of ecology in grassland areas. 
what happens under natural circumstances is that animals will move into an area, you know, say bison or wild horses or something like that. They'll move into an area. And the first thing that they eat is the plants that are most palatable to them. You know, usually these are the plants that have the most nutrition, the most calories, that type of thing. They'll eat those plants. They'll eat the leaves of those plants. And then they'll, they'll move on to the next plant and the next plant. When a plant loses its leaves, when a grass plant loses its leaves, it pulls energy and resources from its roots to rebuild those leaves. You know, this weakens the roots a little bit. The new leaves that come out are extremely nutritious. So when that plant starts to regrow its leaves, if the animals are still in the area, they're going to come back and eat that, that new leaf again. Well, in order to rebuild the leaf, the plant has to pull more resources from its roots. Over a time, you know, a few months, this weakens those grass plants or whatever type of palatable plants the animals are eating. It weakens those. So they diminish on the landscape. And the way that the natural ecosystem works is when those plants dim diminish, the natural disturbance-loving species expand. So things like ragweed, for example, um, mare's tail, bee balm, these types of plants will expand when there's a void caused by overgrazing. Under natural circumstances, these plants start to take over part of the landscape, and they're not palatable to the grazers, so the grazers just move on to some other area, and they'll graze there. They may not return to the area that's been covered in ragweed for a couple of years, you know, after a couple of years, the native palatable plants, the grasses and other palatable plants, will have rebuilt their roots. They'll be able to put up this new foliage that outcompetes the ragweed and the other colonizing plants. And then it's back to a grassland that's desirable for the grazers to come in. So then they come back. But it's this long, expanded cycle in most cases. It, at least that's what I understand from most ecologists. When the land was fenced in, there was no place for animals to go. Um, quite often, or Almost all of the time, people set up cattle operations so that they can have just as many animals on the land as possible. Under these circumstances, the animals are going to eat their favorite plants first, but then there's nowhere for them to go. So they eat their, when the plants send up their new shoots, they eat those again and again and again until the plant finally has no more energy or resources left in its roots and it dies. Then the animals focus on their next favorite plant. When that's gone, their next favorite plant. Eventually, the land starts to come up in ragweed and things like that. What happens in a lot of cases is farmers will see that as weeds, so they'll put out broadleaf pest, broadleaf, um, broadleaf killing chemicals, herbicides, and that kills not just the ragweed, but a whole swath of native plants. And then there's this big void on the landscape, so they'll plant invasive grasses, things like Bermuda or Bahia grass, that come from other parts of the world and can take a lot of abuse. And unfortunately, that landscape, that Bermuda Bahia pasture, which is common in southeastern Oklahoma, is almost an ecologically dead landscape. Um, it doesn't produce anything much for pollinators or different types of habitat. So it's another type of ecological disaster. But in some cases, it can be reversed. In most cases, it can be reversed. It just takes some work. In our case, when we purchased the land, it was covered in ragweed, uh, goatweed, monarda, bee balm. Um, these plants that are not palatable. But fortunately, it had never been plowed. And fortunately, most of it had never been seeded in those invasive type of pasture grasses. So these were tremendous advantages for us as we went along. We didn't realize how big of an advantage at the start. But as we went along, we learned that. In trying to meet the goals of our project, uh, we called we called this farm non Awaya Farm. non Awaya means a place of growth in Choctaw. Um, some elders refer to our place of creation as non Awaya. So we named our farm after the Choctaw place of creation, but also we want it to be a place of growth for us in, in the culture and in our relationship with the land and hopefully for other folks that are interested in interacting with the land and, and learning about landscape ecology and traditional land-based culture. In attempting to carry out the, the goals of non Awaya farm that I laid out earlier, uh, we first looked to Choctaw concepts of interacting with the land. The most direct aspect of an interaction between people and land, whether it's indigenous cultures or anybody, is really the foods that sustain us. You know, food is really about the most direct connection that anybody has with the land. And, you know, in my understanding of Choctaw culture, and, you know, this is just my way of looking at it, but there are four different concepts 
of interacting with the land that are pertinent here to understanding the Choctaw method of landscape management, to understand the Choctaw method of producing a high quality of life from interacting with the land, also potentially for restoring land. So the first of these concepts is yohbi, which means purity. And, you know, each one of these topics is something that you could talk about for half an hour, but I'll just summarize each one briefly. From a traditional Choctaw concept, purity means keeping things in the sacred order that God created them. So, for example, um, there are certain types of foods that the Choctaw ancestors considered to be unclean, and they avoided them. When Europeans brought in new foods, some of those were adopted readily, particularly plant foods. But some of them, particularly the, the meat-based foods, were not. One example is the pig, shoka in Choctaw. Choctaw people um, looked at the pig and they, they believed that it led a filthy life. So Choctaws did not eat pork meat originally um, for quite some time after hogs were introduced by the Spanish. And Choctaws eventually began participating in a market economy with the French colonies of New Orleans and Mobile, Biloxi. Part of this market economy, they began raising French hogs but accounts from the time period talk about how Choctaw people didn't eat the meat from the animals that they raised. They just raised them and then took them down to, to trade to the French. Even much later in time, after Choctaws had started to eat pork meat, you know, it was a custom for Choctaw men whose wives were expecting not to eat hog meat out of belief that it could possibly injure the unborn child. And, you know, in a way, that concept, that food taboo was exactly right. You know, much later in time, in the 1900s, scientists found that hogs do carry a number of diseases that transmit to humans. When, within the first couple hundred years of European contact, about 90% of the Native American population died because of European disease. You know, it's estimated that 100 million people may have lived in the Americas at the time of Columbus, which is actually more people than lived in Europe at that time. But within a couple hundred years, it was down to just 10 million Native people. In Europe and most other places where people lived in the world, they had been interacting closely with domesticated animals, you know, hogs, chickens, things like that, um, living in very close proximity to them, picking up diseases from these animals, um, some of the people dying, but those that survived, developing immunities to the diseases that, that uh, those animals carried. Native people, on the other hand, had not lived in close proximity to these disease-carrying animals. So when people from other parts of the world moved in, and brought those diseases with them, they had very little resistance to those diseases. So that's the reason for the population crash. But if you think about it, for more than 10,000 years, Native people lived lives almost completely free of contagious disease. They didn't have the flu, they didn't have bad colds, they didn't have the measles, you know, almost, almost no contagious disease at all. And it's because they lived in a way that they understood to be pure in terms of their interaction with the land and other organisms. Another Choctaw concept that, that I see in terms of land and food is diversity. The Choctaw traditional food way, you know, it, it relied on each of the different ecosystems within the Choctaw homeland during different seasons of the year. The Choctaw year was divided into a 13-month calendar, and during each of those months, specific activities were conducted in different areas and different ecosystems of the Choctaw homeland in order to provide for a high quality of life. The Choctaw New Year began around the time of the fall equinox, and this was right after the agricultural fields had been harvested. The communities would be going out in the mixed hardwood communities around the settlements, and they'd be collecting a, a vast harvest of acorns. Um, in good years, they'd be collecting hickory nuts, and they'd be taking those, they'd be parching those in the field and taking them back to their settlements to store for winter. Shortly later, the able-bodied people from the community would head out and they would go to hunting areas, you know, say about the time of European, sustained European contact, 1700. Um, they didn't use the horse much, so they would walk to these hunting areas and they'd be within about 100 miles of their main village sites. In these hunting areas, uh, they hunted deer. That was the most important game animal at that time and place. But they also hunted other things like bison if given the opportunity. These hunting camps were really... Like today we think about Native American food, a lot of people think about it as being meat-based, and for some tribes it certainly was. For the Choctaw, 
from what we understand of the past, the only time of the year when meat was the dominant part of the diet, like a regular main course dish, was in the fall, in these fall hunting camps. And their, their meat was very common. Um, as the season went on, as it got colder, the hunting camps would move down into the lower areas along the cane brinks, and they would hunt black bear. The black bear was really important because of the its fat was processed into grease, which was used for a variety of different things with food, but also industry. As the season progressed, um, the community would move back into the villages and they would start to prepare their agricultural fields. The first field that they prepared was right around their houses. This would be planted with their fa favorite vegetables, but also tanchosi, which is a quick ripening variety of Choctaw corn. They would not plant their main fields until the wild fruits like the mulberries and the blackberries had started to come out in the natural areas away from the villages. And this was so that the birds and the squirrels would focus on it, those areas rather than focusing on destroying their young agricultural plants. Ultimately, they would plant two other agricultural fields in the late spring. Um, one was a corn, bean, and squash communal field. One was an outlying field that focused on squash or later in time it focused on melons. Um, they would, they would, Maintain those fields through the early part of summer. Uh, the women and girls would go out and, and hoe them up, uh, mound up the beans, that type of thing. By late summer, those fields were left on their own to dry, ripen in the sun. The community would go to river areas, and there they would fish in the hottest part of the season. Or those Choctaw communities that lived down on the Gulf, they would go out and do some major shellfish collecting, uh, major types of fishing. The harvest season happened after that. So this is the Choctaw seasonal cycle, at least in terms of food and the different areas, different ecosystems that we lived in. And you can see that it was diverse. You know, we relied not just on one agricultural crop, but on three. Uh, we relied not just on agricultural crops, but on hunting. Not just on hunting, but hunting several important animals, including the deer, the bear, the bison, but also dozens of, of lesser important animals. We relied on the upland forest communities for nuts. We relied on the lowland uh, swamps and streams for fishing. So this was an incredibly diverse life way, an incredibly diverse diet. And out of diversity comes resiliency. So, for example, when there was a really bad drought and the corn crops failed, people didn't have to go and plow and just damage the land trying to make a system work that, that wasn't sustainable given the rainfall that year. Instead, they could rely on all these other sources of food so that they could live abundantly without damaging the land. Another concept of Choctaw interaction with the land is the whole. So that this is something that can be talked about for a very long time. But just a, a quick example, in the communal field that I was telling you about, it was based on corn, beans, and squash. First, the corn was planted. When it got up to about two feet tall, they would plant bean seeds in the mound that the corn was planted in around the edge of it. The beans provide, well, the corn stalk provides a place for the beans to climb. So the beans with a little bit of training, they can be wrapped around the corn stalk as the corn stalk grows, the bean vines grow too, and that provides them a place. The corn pulls a lot of nutrition, a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. The beans being the legumes put some of that nitrogen back in. After the beans were planted sometime in the areas, the rows between the corn mounds, they would plant squash seeds. And at least the types of Choctaw squash that still survive today have these massive broad leaves. Those leaves shade the soil. Um, in the past, they would protect the soil from drying out. They would also limit weedy competition. That's a little bit less the case today with invasive grasses like Bermuda, but that's how it used to work in the past. So there were also different types of plants that would come up wild in these systems and they would just let them grow. Things like lamb's quarter, um, sunflower, if it came up on its own or sometimes they planted it and it created this basic ecosystem in their agricultural crops that brought in pollinators the plants supported each other by doing that they held on to the fertility of the soil a longer time and if you eat the products from this corn beans and squash it provides a much more complete nutrition than any one of those alone so it's an ecosystem in the agricultural crop and it's almost like an ecosystem of food in the at the family dinner table Eventually, even with this system, the land would be degraded of some of its nutrition, so they would let the field go fallow. But they didn't just let it sit there. They, they took it through a series of enhanced steps of ecological succession. 
So after it was a field and went fallow, the first thing that would come up was strawberries. And strawberries would be maintained by fire, you know, regularly burning that area. There are accounts from um, Mississippi of Europeans in Chickasaw Gardens, but Choctaw would have been the same. Being able to pick up a whole hat full of strawberries in one of those old strawberry patches without even taking a step, just from standing there, they could pick enough strawberries to fill a whole hat. As eco ecological succession continued, it would go from being a strawberry field to being um, a blackberry thicket. And the blackberries, of course, are an important food. They're important enough that there's a month in the Choctaw calendar named after them. Uh, they, too, could be maintained by fire to an extent. Eventually, blackberry thicket would give way to an early successional patch of open woodland. Um, things like persimmons, sassafras trees, um, all of these provided important food resources. Eventually, it could become a forest depending on its location, You know how, how elevated it was, how much rain it got. It could become a forest and provide oak and hickory resources. And then centuries later, people could come back and make that into an agricultural field again when the system had completely rebuilt itself. There are many concepts of the whole in Choctaw society and land management, but that, that's one of them. The last concept, at least as I see it, is respect, Ayokpanchi. And this is the most important concept, but this is also where the Choctaw method of interacting with the land differs from that of, for example, colonial society. Some of these things, some of these characteristics ultimately led to a colonial society being irritated with Choctaw people or looking down on the Choctaw way of doing things. One example would be in the traditional Choctaw way of living. It, it wasn't necessary to work from sunup to sundown to get all the things that people needed for life. At least in modern indigenous cultures, some of them live in the most inhospitable places on earth, but even there they can get everything they need to live in about four hours of work per day. And you see that in European accounts of Choctaw life, too. You know, folks would work in the garden and they would hunt. They'd work really hard, but then they had all this extra time in the day to do other things. Socialize, play stickball, gamble, whatever. So because they didn't spend 12 hours a day extracting the land's resources, you know, the French often called Choctaw people lazy. Choctaw people traditionally did not very often invade the lands of other tribes. Usually, and you can look at statements that Choctaw people made 200, 300 years ago, usually Choctaw people preferred to stay at home and fight defensively. They said because they could be sure to face warriors instead of invading someone else's home and, you know, fighting people that were non-combatants. When the French tried to get Choctaws to fight other tribes, they were occasionally successful, but usually they were not. Usually the Choctaws would not invade somebody else's land. So the French considered Choctaw people to be cowards in some of those instances. Looking to more modern times, anthropology categorizes human societies according to their level of social complexity. And, you know, anthropology would characterize Choctaw society and ancestral Choctaw society as a tribe or a chiefdom through most of our history. That's in contradistinction to modern Western civilization, which is considered a state level society. It's a higher level of organization. If you look at anthropological writings, at least up until 15 years ago, and to some extent still today, you know, they sort of characterize the Choctaw ancestors and other southeastern tribes as a failure of attaining a state-level society. But when you look at this, and when you look at you know, Choctaw's reluctance to fight other tribes on their land, um, Choctaw's reluctance to spend all day extracting resources from the land, all of these things ultimately come back to respect, you know. You take as much as you need from the land, but no more. You respect the sovereignty of other communities around you. You don't invade them, usually. Um, <clears throat> you respect the land by not developing and growing just in exponentially until the land can no longer support you. You stop somewhere below that so that you have a fully sustainable life. <clears throat> all of these things come from respect. All of these things also lead to sustainability. So these are, are just a few points, but there's so much that you can learn by looking at the deep Choctaw relationship with the land that can inform the way that may be sustainable to interact with the land today. So how did we implement this? And again, other concepts from holistic landscape management, restorative landscape management on Nanawaya Farm. Well, the first thing that we did was we tried to rebuild respect with the land. You know, from our perspective, the land had been disrespected because it was just grazed to the point that the fertility was mined out of the soils and the native plant communities were just obliterated. 
So the first way to begin rebuilding that respect was to let the land go fallow for a year, um, not have any animals on it at all, and just let those plant communities start to rebuild. When we did put animals out there, we divided the land. Instead of it having just be a 160-acre chunk, we divided it into 23 different pastures. And when we put the animals out there, you know, not all these pastures were built, but we continued building them over time. It took us a few years. When the animals are, are in one of these pastures, obviously it concentrates their grazing in that area. Going back to what I was saying before, the animals are going to concentrate on the plants that are most nutritious. They're the tastiest plants. They're going to eat those. And then those plants are going to have to pull nutrition and resources from their roots to rebuild. But if you have the land broken up into 23 pastures or, or 15 or 30 or whatever, you move the animals from one pasture to another on a relatively rapid rate. In our case, we usually move them every two to five days, which means that they don't have time to eat that same plant twice. The plant, the palatable plant gets eaten once and then the animals move on and it gets time to rebuild its roots. With 23 pastures, we have between about 60 and 100 days, depending on the pasture, before the animals come back. For most plants, that gives them ample time to rebuild their roots. So they're, they're thriving again by the time the animals come back. If you time the grazing in such a way that it does not correspond with the time when those palatable plants go to seed, then they can go to seed and they can spread. Or some of the palatable plants have rhizomes that go under the soil. And if they're not being overgrazed, they can spread and spread and spread. So this is a, a technique, you know, in my opinion, it's not a technique to la manage the land forever, but it is an effective technique in a place like ours that's been damaged by overgrazing. It's an effective technique to bring balance back to the land by allowing those palatable plant species to recover. Just by doing this alone, we saw tremendous changes on the land. Um, I'll go into those a little bit more detail later. The animal that we brought out to the land was bison. If you look at the earliest written accounts from this part of the world, um, clearly bison were a keystone species. Um, you can do similar things with cattle or sheep, but bison are important culturally, and they also do a few things that cattle and sheep do not do. One of these is that bison produce wallows, um, you know, buffalo wallows. When it's summertime and hot, Flies and other insects kind of chase the buffalo herds around. And one of the ways that the animals combat that is they'll find some some dry soil and they'll wallow in it. They'll wallow in it and it becomes this dry, powdery, bare soil area. That dry, powdery soil gets into their wool coats and it helps protect them from the biting insects. On the landscape, it sets ecological succession back to zero because it's just bare, powdery dirt. This provides heterogeneity on the landscape, which provides diverse habitats. Um, some types of plants, colonizing plants like that bare soil so they can move in. And then there may be certain animals that rely on them, certain types of butterflies, certain types of birds that like those plants that aren't found elsewhere in the landscape. It also creates a patchiness. Some types of animals, <coughs> insects, lizards, birds, may require a place where they have access both to bare soil and to taller grasses. So this provides that habitat for them. Again, Diversity means resiliency. The more types of plants that you have on the land, native plants, the more types of native animals that you have, native pollinators, the more resilient the system becomes. Buffalo love cedar trees, especially in the summertime. Um, cedar trees are native. In the past, they used to just live in the uplands because fire has been suppressed. They've spread to the lowlands and they, they're taking the land in a lot of big places. That's not a good thing. Um, cedar trees have their purposes, but if the landscape becomes dominated by cedar, then it becomes almost an ecological dead zone because not that many animals rely on cedar. Cedar also sucks up a whole bunch of water. So restoring the land often means setting the cedar back. And bison, because they love cedar in the summertime, they'll, they'll rub all over it. They'll rub their horns on it and their faces. Um, they'll break the trees, I believe to get the sap from the tree on their fur, I think it helps protect them from insects. It's kind of an insect repellent, I think. But this will kill the cedar trees. So that helps bring balance back to the land by taking cedar trees out of these areas they're not supposed to be in. We have this rotational grazing pattern set up like I talked about, but in some areas like watering areas, you know, our animals have access to that for more than just a short period of time. They may have access to that area for a month at a time if they're going to water. And when they do that, they always follow the path of least resistance. So they'll create these trails out through the woods. And those trails, just like the buffalo wallows, 
set ecological succession back to zero. So it creates more plant habitat, which creates more animal habitat. With these techniques, you know, we saw major changes on the land within just three years. And I, I wish I could show you a picture of it, but some of our areas went from being just total goat weed and ragweed to being these really diverse pastures with lots of grass and palatable plants, but also lots of other native plants. As I mentioned earlier, we were fortunate that this land wasn't plowed. Uh, we were fortunate that only a few of the pastures were seeded with invasive grasses because this allowed the roots and the seeds from the native plant community that used to exist there to survive in the soil until we created the conditions for it to thrive. When we set up our rotational grazing, when we brought the buffalo out there, uh, we limited their numbers so it was in balance with the land. When we did these things, we saw an explosion of native plants coming back up from the seeds and roots in the soil. Um, to date, we've We've documented 185 native tall grass prairie species that have reemerged in our pastures since we set this up. That's really important for a variety of reasons. You know, obviously one of them is that diversity reads, leads to resiliency. If it's a bad year for one type of plant, well, then another type of plant's going to expand. You know, it will help cover the soil. It will help protect the soil. Maybe it's got a special benefit for pollinators or certain kind of bird. Maybe the animals like to eat it, whatever. But with 185 different species, it leads to resiliency and strength in those pastures. Particularly with the native tall grass plants, which is principally what I'm talking about, actually more is going on under the soil than above the soil. So these grasses, you know, they may get six feet tall. But the grasses and native wildflowers, they have roots that may go down 12 feet into the soil. Um, there's a lot of benefit to that. For example, um, big blue stem is one of the most common native tall grasses in our area. And if you have an acre of big blue stem, its roots going down six or eight feet can capture about 14,000 pounds of carbon. So that's that much carbon out of the air, which of course helps to fight climate change a little bit, but also by putting all of that organic material into the soil, it makes the soil like a sponge. So obviously with climate change, as the, the planet heats up, we're getting more severe rain events and more severe droughts. So that means that water management becomes important. It means the soils are more prone to flooding, they're more prone to drought, all else being equal. But if you have this native plant community there with 14,000 pounds of organic material per acre, that absorbs that water like a sponge and then it slowly releases it. So it makes the land much more resistant against both drought and flooding. Many of these plants have special relationships with microscopic animals that live in the soil. Microscopic animals, fungus, bacteria, different microbes. Some of the plants put out what's known as exudates in their roots. Um, exudates are sugars that attract microbes. Some plants put out very specific exudates that attract just one particular species of microbe. Soil science is, is just in its infancy, infancy stages, especially soil molecular biology. Um, they say there's something like 10 million different species of soil microbes in a tablespoon of soil. And these soil microbes are ultimately what allow the plants to live through their interactions with the roots. And ultimately, the plants are what allow animals to live. There's some really neat soil microbes. Um, there are millions that are not even named yet. If you get a chance, if you want to see just one that's pretty cool, uh, look up water bear. Do a Google search for a water bear. These are these neat microscopic creatures. They look like six-legged bears. Um, they, they hang out at the plant roots. They're incredibly resilient. If it gets too dry, they just dry up into these dicks, discs. Um, I, I was reading one account about some folks who had plant roots that had been stored in some type of a facility since the 1800s, and they got those roots wet, and the water bears just came back to life. Um, they can withstand boiling temperatures. They're, they're pretty amazing, resi resilient creatures, and they're just one of many examples that live under the soil. The, the roots of the prairie protect the soil in other ways, too. Um, one of the most obvious is erosion. You know, I, I've seen pictures from back in the Dust Bowl days where most of the grass is gone, but then there will be this, cl this clump of little blue stem, one of the native grasses that has roots that go down about five feet. And those roots just preserve the soil right under the plant. Everything else is gone, but where this native plant lived, the soil is still there.
Many of the native plants have specific relationships above ground with a wide variety of insects. You know, it may be ants, it may be mites. Um, for many of them, it's different pollinators. You know, the, the forbs are wildflowers, and most of those attract pollinators. Some of them are, attract a general range of pollinators. Some plants just attract a specific pollinator. For example, yucca is pollinated just by this one species of moth. And it's this really re neat relationship how the moth pollinates it and makes sure that it doesn't damage the seeds of the yucca to the point that it could prevent it from growing or for the next generation from growing. That relationship between that specific species of moth and the yucca plant has been going on for 40 million years. Pretty incredible. When we go out on our land with all these different native plants that exist there now, we see pollinators all the time that we don't even recognize, but they'll have the, the sacks on their legs full of pollen from some type of native plant that's out there. Today, people are concerned about the bumble, or, or they're concerned about the honeybee. Um, you know, honeybee numbers are down for a variety of reasons. But honeybees are, are really not the most important pollinator. Pollinators are important. They s provide services that make most of the world's food crop possible. Without pollinators, humanity would starve to death quickly. But honeybees are not the most important or the most threatened pollinator. There are actually 4,000 different species of native bees. Most of them are solitary. You know, they live in the stems of plants. They, they raise their young in the ground, things like that. You may not even see most of them except at flowers. Um, and then there's a, a wide variety of moths and butterflies and flies, wasps that all pollinate. It's this intricate web of life, and it's diverse, and every part of that supports every other part. So ultimately having a, a pasture that's got native plants in it that supports all of these specific pollinators and general pollinators provides that basis for agricultural crops to be pollinated, the agricultural crops that keep us alive. Or for example, um, the prairie areas and <clears throat> the shrubs and small trees that live within it, they provide habitat for caterpillars, for different types of moths and butterflies. Those are the main food source for most birds. So if you have these areas that supports these populations of birds, um, grassland birds are rapidly going extinct in this country. But having this habitat type supports them, and then those birds support all kinds of ecological services. For example, during certain stages of their life, they'll eat insects that can be harmful to crops or harmful to people or spread disease, that type of thing. We need those birds in order to have a high-quality, healthy life. And the, in order to have those birds, we need prairie areas and diverse ecological areas that can support them. In terms of ecological diversity, another important thing that we've been trying to implement on our land with, with some success is fire, range fire. Range fires happen naturally through lightning strikes in the Great Plains and also during drought conditions in the Choctaw homeland. But for more than 10,000 years, people have been intentionally using fire as a land management tool. When fire goes through, it resets ecological succession. So I'm sure you've seen a place where a pasture has burned. You know, it'll be dark colored and the grass will be gone. The dark color comes from the, the soot and the carbon in those plants as they burn. When that soil is dark, when it doesn't have any insulation from last year's plant growth, it heats up quickly in the sun. And in the spring, this will allow earlier germination. The plants get a head start on the spring season. They grow more quickly. Earlier, I was telling you that when a plant gets grazed, it, the, the new shoots that it puts up are extremely nutritious. <clears throat> That's the same thing when a plant gets burned. It grows back very nutritious at first. So animals are going to want to come to that area. Um, they're going to want to eat those fresh new plants. Native people and people all over the world took advantage of that. They would burn an area and then for a few months, that area would concentrate game animals so that they could hunt them easily. They wouldn't have to look over huge areas. They could just go to this patch that they burned and wait for the animals to come. Obviously, burning um, makes it easier to go across areas. It removes the underbrush. You know, dense prairie can be six feet tall. It can be really hard to walk through. By burning it, you, you can move through it much more easily. Burning also takes care of some types of pests, for example, ticks. You know, burning will kill the ticks in the leaf litter and in the grass. It doesn't completely eradicate them, but it, it does keep their numbers down. If burns happen on a regular basis. Burns also create ecological diversity, and there are different reasons for this. Some native plants are adapted to burn. You know, they may seed better or grow better if they burn. 
Um, they may be adapted to growing in areas where the competition's been removed because of a burn. Various different reasons. Um, the way that our ancestors did burns was pretty frequently across the landscape every few years. Today, wildfires happen, and they're often in places where fires have been suppressed for a long period of time, which means that a lot of plant material has died and hit the ground and just piled up. When a fire comes through there, it has a huge fuel load to burn. And because of this huge fuel load, the fires get extremely hot and destructive. They will kill plants that are fire adapted. Um, they will kill the microbes in the soil that get so hot, and it can take time to rebuild from that. The way that it was done traditionally in the past with regular fires, it prevented a heavy fuel load to the point that these fires didn't burn everywhere. You know, they would burn out in some regions and then travel to other areas. So it made this patchy burned landscape and that created the ultimate habitat for plant and animal diversity. We've tried to reestablish fire on our land. Um, we've had a fire that came across there by accident. We've tried to reestablish regular burns. Um, that can be a little tricky to do. But uh, if you work with a burn plant, it is possible to do those. We hope to have more success with controlled burns in the future. With all of this, as I said, we've had 185 native plant species that we've seen come back to the landscape. But there are some important species that are missing or some important species that should be there in big numbers, but they're just there in small numbers. So after five years of this landscape management, we decided that we needed to go back and reintroduce some of those plants that should have been on the land that weren't. And we tried over the past few years, just little experiments with eight different planting techniques. The way that prairie restoration often happens is that people will go in and they'll spray everything, they'll kill everything, and then they'll start over from scratch. But it's much, much more valuable to have native prairie, native plant community that's always been there rather than starting over from scratch. Because the community that's always been there has much more plant and animal diversity. It's also got more diversity in the soil microbes. So... In our case, we have 185 native species out there. We certainly didn't want to start over from scratch. So we had to find a planting technique that didn't disturb the soil, didn't kill the native plants that were already there, but nevertheless could introduce the plants that we wanted to be there. And after trying eight different techniques, the one that we found to be most effective is to go out in the fall or the winter or the early spring, and we just use a big, Arden, a big uh, Amish garden hoe and we'll take that through the soil. We'll remove all the grass and plant material, turn the soil over like a garden in an area about two feet diameter. And then we'll plant our <clears throat> whatever we want to grow there in that loose soil like it was a garden. In the case of native wildflowers, you know, most of those get planted in the fall so that their seeds can sit in the cool, damp soil through the whole winter, which makes many species more able to germinate. For the grasses, uh, we were able to plant those up through April. And the way that we planted most of the grasses is that we would mix the grass seeds with the seeds from native legumes. You know, corn is a type of native grass, beans are a type of legume. So we were almost redoing that type of setup, the corn and beans setup, by planting legumes. Uh, they put nitrogen in our degraded soil, and then the grass is able to, to utilize that to get a better start. This is time consuming. It's a time consuming way to plant, but it definitely gets you in contact with the earth and helps you to see little details out there in the pastures that you might have missed. Over the course of this winter, we did 2,800 of these plantings. Uh, we did them on a grid in some areas, um, some areas that were particularly degraded. We did one of these plantings about every 12 feet through the whole area. In other areas, we were just trying to introduce a specific species, in which case we just did, you know, selected plantings here and there in areas where we thought those species would do well. Ultimately, this winter, though, through these techniques, we planted about seven acres. So now we've got those coming up. Uh, we've got the, we planted as big a diversity as we could possibly get. And today we've got a lot of those plants coming up. Some of them, some of the annuals are starting to create their wildflowers and bring in pollinators. And it's pretty neat to see every day we go out there, there's something different to encounter. In terms of rebuilding the purity of the landscape, um, one thing that we face today is invasive plants. And I, I've talked about the invasive pasture grasses that are brought in that can compete against the natives. They definitely compete against native gardens, but there are others as well. Uh, one of the ones that we face on our farm is Bradford pear. Bradford pear is 
a plant that's ultimate origins are in China, I believe. And it gets used as an ornamental landscape plant. But then it spreads. Um, you know, it, it makes these little fruits. They get these little inedible fruits. They get transported by birds to, to native country, to farms, to pastures, things like that. And when they go wild, the Bradford pear turns into this awful thorny tree that makes these nasty thickets. And they're not very useful for much. They don't support a lot of native habitat, but they will take over native areas in a hurry. So this year we've been concentrating on cutting those out of the land. Uh, we've been concentrating on opening up more of the land so that the sun can get to it. There's a lot of, lot of interesting things about the plants that are coming up out there um, in terms of Choctaw knowledge about them. Quite often the Choctaw plant name records interesting information. So for example, yarrow, it's this Native wildflower it comes up in the spring, gets maybe three feet tall. It has these clusters of white blossoms. In the Choctaw language, that plant is called Ibakoa Inkish. And literally that means nosebleed medicine. So in the, the things that I and the things that Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation does, we don't really give out information about Choctaw traditional medicines, but that's an example right there where the Choctaw name for the plant gives ideas about what that plant could be used for. Uh, another example is showy wild garlic. It's this beautiful plant. It comes up in the spring. It has these short little white or purple flowers. Um, again, it's showy white garlic in English. In Choctaw, it's hapon falaha y quiche. And that means onion medicine in Choctaw. There are other examples in our lowlands. Uh, we've seen this explosion of swamp sunflower. Um, sunflowers the young plants are really neat in that not only do their flowers kind of look like a sun but for the young plants the the flowers can follow the sun they can turn and follow the sun through the day the choctaw name for sunflower is hashoshi which means baby sun in the choctaw traditional way of understanding the world the sun was god's eye watching the earth and as long as it shone on people then it illuminated the hinahanta the white path to victory and people would prosper and there are many cultural connections with that, you know, the, with the sacred fire, with the green corn ceremony, with the way the Choctaw houses were set up, to the fact that Choctaw diplomats preferred to interact with American diplomats in the sun. You know, they would have councils in full sun so that the sun could watch them. You know, all of that's tied into the Choctaw name for this, this native wildflower and for understandings of it. This native wildflower was uh, part of the Eastern Agricultural Complex. You know, on the planet, there are only 10 places that we know of where people independently developed agriculture. And one of those was in the Midwestern United States. And one of the plants that they domesticated was the sunflower. So again, it, restoring that on the land, restoring that on the land of our farm, brings back all of these cultural connections and this cultural knowledge through that plant. <clears throat> you know, I, I, Interacting with these plants, going out among them, you know, I think that each one has its own spirit. I think that each one has its own knowledge that our ancestors and the ancestors of other indigenous people unlock through regularly interacting with them. I love going out and finding some new plant that's reemerged from the soil. It's like a piece of the homeland that's come back from the dead and it's there. And it's neat to think about, you know, if it's a wildflower, you know, 600 generations of native women looked at that flower. It's interesting to think about them and their lives and what, what they, the type of landscape that they interacted with. You know, it's interesting to think about some of these plants were on this land 12,000 years ago when native men were hunting woolly mammoths and things like that. It's neat to think about the things that these specific plants have seen and what they bring back to the landscape. Many of these plants have specific uses in Choctaw culture. You know, one example is the thistle. Um, thistles have a bad name. There are lots of invasive thistles that are causing all kinds of problems, but there are also many species of native thistle. The Choctaw name for thistle is Shomo, and these are an important part of Choctaw culture, one element of Choctaw culture. Uh, and this is the blowgun. In the, the Choctaw language, you know, the, well, there's the blowgun, it's made out of river cane, and then it has these darts that go inside it, and you blow, and the dart goes out with a lot of force through the through the blowgun, and then it was used for hunting birds, squirrels, things like that. In the Choctaw language, the, the word for blowgun dart is shomo holoti, and that comes back to the Choctaw word for thistle, shomo. 
Holoti means wrapped. So that's talking about the way that when the thistle flower heads mature and turn white, you can pull the fluff from those flower heads and use a piece of string to wrap it around the back end of a blowgun dart, and then that seals the breech so that the dart's effective going through the blowgun. There are many, many other examples. Uh, one of them is lamb's quarter. Um, this is a plant called tanishi in the Choctaw language. It likes fertile soil. It likes river bottoms, places like that. It'll also grow in the upland and shade. And it's ironic that it also comes up at, in people's gardens. And usually people see that plant and they, they chop it down or they poison it, they get rid of it. However, this plant is more nutritious than anything that's growing in a garden. I, its green leaves compare favorably to raw spinach for nutrition. Spinach, you know, it only grows during the cool season. Lamb's quarter, you can pick its nutritious leaves through the entire growing season. You can eat them raw or boiled. Unlike spinach, at the, the end of the growing season in the fall, just about Thanksgiving time in this area, the plant produces this massive seed crop. Uh, you can easily get a cup or two of seed from just one plant. Lamb's quarter is related to quinoa. Those seeds are similar to quinoa, you know, which costs a fortune to buy at the grocery store. Uh, you can take those seeds, lightly roast them, grind them a little bit, and then make them into a stew. Um, before European contact, about a thousand years before corn agriculture, lamb scorter was the main domesticate in the eastern United States. You know, if you went through the eastern United States 2,000 years ago, instead of seeing fields of corn, you'd see fields of lamb scorter. And the national dish was the stew that was made out of its roasted seeds. You'd take the roasted seeds and boil them with hickory nuts and deer meat. And it, it's pretty complete nutrition. And like I say, it was the national dish back then. Some of the plants are native just to Oklahoma, not to the Choctaw homeland. One example of that is Texas bull nettle. And the Choctaws interacted with nettles in the, in the eastern United States. The name for them was Hatak Holfpa, which means Burns Man. And the nettles that grow in the Choctaw homeland are, are edible when they're young. Um, they can be, their stalks can be processed for these fibers that can be spun into yarn, that can be made into textiles. Well, the nettle that exists in Oklahoma is not like that. It's called the Texas bull nettle. And the Choctaw name for it is Hatak Holfpa Chito, which means Burns a Man Big. So that name refers back to the type of stinging nettle that existed in the Choctaw homeland, Hatakolfpa, but it's got chitto added to it because the sting's more powerful, it's bigger. This plant can't be used for textiles and the leaves can't be eaten like the ones in the Choctaw homeland. But I've spoken with elders who told me that after their ancestors arrived in Oklahoma, they learned that you can make tongs and pick the seeds from this plant in the summertime. And if you get all of the stinging hairs the, the capsule with the stinging hairs off of it, those seeds taste like peanuts and they're really nutritious. So in, in just a, a few short years after coming to Oklahoma, Choctaw people learn how to use this plant. It's pretty noxious because of its stings. There are many, many examples. Um, I'm going to just do, I think, one more. And this is the sensitive briar. This is a plant that's come up all over our pastures since we changed the management. It's a legume, so it heals the soil, adds nitrogen to the soil. And it's called sensitive plant because it has these fern-like leaves. If you touch the leaf, it will close in front of your eyes, just like a Venus flytrap almost. It, it visibly closes. It's one of the few plants that you can see visibly move in response to a touch. The Choctaw name for this plant is tohkil. And interestingly, the Choctaw name, the Choctaw word for squint is tohkilit pisa. So it appears that the Choctaw word for squint refers back to this plant. You know, probably the way that it closes its fern-like leaves when it gets touched. It's probably seeing that the human eye with the eyelashes is kind of similar when you squint. It kind of closes up. But it's just a, a neat and unexpected little bit of traditional knowledge and insight that, that comes from the name of this plant that's growing out there. Um, I've gone through quite a few plants. I'll, I'm going to change over a little bit to... You know, using the whole of the land, the bigger picture. So we've talked about plant ecology and landscape ecology, but there's also cultural aspects to this beyond just the plant names. Um, there are different things that we use out there to help revitalize Choctaw culture. Um, for example, we'll harvest some of the oak trees, the, 
the trunks from the oak trees that are growing there along the prairie areas. And we'll cut them and season them. And then we'll use them to make mortars, kitty in the Choctaw language. To make a mortar, well, a, I should say a, a kitty is like this, a, a mortar is like this um, hard wooden implement that holds food while you grind it with a pestle. So it's used for grinding up corn, um, acorns, things like that into flour. So to make the depression for holding the food in the log, what you, you do is you take a hot coal and you set Okay, uh, well, seem to have lost... Hard. Are you, are you still there, Ian? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, you cut out for about, oh, I don't know, it was about 20 or 30 seconds there. Uh, you were talking about the kitty. So, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. My connection's not always stable. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, it just cut out for a moment, and uh, I'm glad I didn't lose you, though. So, but uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, continue because I have you now. Okay. So we'll go out. And we'll, we'll harvest other things from the land for different aspects of Choctaw culture. Um, we'll cut oak trees, and we'll take the we'll take the trunks of those oak trees, and we'll we'll let them dry out for a year or so, and we use them to make a mortar. It's called kitty in the Choctaw language. A mortar is used for holding food while it's ground up with a pestle. Um, sometimes you see a mortar and pestle in a kitchen for grinding spice. Usually they're made out of stone. The Choctaw version is much bigger than that, and it's used like for grinding corn into cornmeal. So to take this log and put the hole in it to hold the corn while it's ground, what was done in the past and what we still do today is we burn out the hole. Uh, you take a, a coal of hardwood, you put it on the end of the log, and you blow on it downward through a hollow tube, and it acts like a blowtorch. It'll burn away the wood, it will char it. Um, as the burned wood starts to get deeper into the log, you take the coals out, and you take a, a hard stick or something like that and scrape out the soft cracked areas. And then you do it again. As the hole starts to form, uh, you coat the top of the mortar in wet clay. And this prevents it from burning so you can direct the way that the concavity goes. And it's really a neat, efficient way to do it. It's much, much more efficient than trying to carve it out with stone tools. So we'll produce mortars like that. And then we'll take traditional corn or corn that's very similar to our traditional corn. We'll grind it in there. And then we we'll use the, the different types of river cane baskets to process it. Um, some of the things that we make from that corn flour, like walakshi, um, and we gather blackberries, boil them, make a sauce, grind up the corn into flour, take that boiling blackberry juice, dump it on the flour corn that's inside the mortar, stir it up, it makes a purple dough, drop that back into the boiling blackberries, and it makes this delicious traditional cobbler, walakshi. Um, on the edges of the pastures and into the more wooded areas on the land we've got sassafras trees it's a fascinating tree it's called coffee in the choctaw language that species of tree is older than this continent um, dinosaurs used to get shade under its branches it has several uses in choctaw culture uh, one of these is making sassafras tea sassafras tea is the basis for root beer you take the the roots of the plant and you peel them and then you boil them so we'll, we'll make that we'll cook it in clay pots out there on the land We'll harvest acorns in the fall. Um, you can tell how bitter an acorn is by how much of the fruit is covered by the cap. If the cap's tiny and there's this big old acorn, then it's not going to be very bitter. If it's a small, small acorn with a huge cap, it's going to be really bitter. Um, you process that out. You take off the, the skin. You take off the paper. You take off the cap. You crush it up. Mix it with water, and over a long time, you're able to leach that out. So we'll, we'll, we'll process that sometimes. Um, sometimes we cook it in traditional pottery where you take the pottery and set it next to the fire. Um, you fill it full of the stew. You take rocks and put them in the fire and heat them up red hot. And then you put them inside the pot and stir it. It'll take the stew up to the boiling point in like 30 seconds or so. We'll do the same thing. We'll make bread out of the acorn flour. Um, you take the, the acorn flour when it's damp. Put it on the end of a stick and squeeze it real hard and you cook it like a hot dog over a fire. And it's amazing. It tastes like a Russian tea cake without the sugar. Part of our landscape management is keeping the deer population in balance. There are lots and lots of deer out there. So um, my wife's family and also I will hunt out there from time to time in the appropriate season. 
And, you know, sometimes we'll take the, the roast from the deer and we'll cook them over a fire there on the land on a skewer of sassafras wood to put flavor into it. Part of respecting the land and animals is once you harvest something, making sure that you make the very best use out of it. So when we harvest a deer, we don't only take the deer meat, but we'll take all of the bones from the animal and we'll burn those in a fire. And then when you burn them, they change chemically. Um, you can crush them up fairly easily. They become more brittle. We take that brittle crushed bone and we mix it with clay and we use that to make Choctaw traditional pottery, including some of the pots that we cook our food in. Um, we'll, we'll dry the pottery out and then we'll fire it there on the land in a, a bonfire using the wood that comes from the land and our senses to very carefully heat it to just exactly the right temperature. Um, if you eat meat and you get this grisly stuff stuck in your teeth, you know, that's the tendons of the animal. When we harvest a deer, we'll take the, the animal's tendons from its leg and its back. We'll clean those, dry them, shred them. And then we make bowstrings out of them. Uh, we'll get them wet. The tendon has a natural glue in it. We'll take the shredded fibers and twist them and splice them and, and make bowstrings for traditional bows. <coughs> we also tan the hides from the animals. We'll take the hides and put them in a, a soak with wood ash, which kills the bacteria in the hide. It neutralizes the mucous membrane of the hide, which makes the hide waterproof during the animal's life. We'll scrape the hides. We'll um, go to one of the creeks on the land. We'll weight the hides down with rocks under the water and let the water flow over it for 24 hours, which neutralizes the pH. We'll wring the hides out. We'll take the brains from the animal or we'll take egg yolks and we dress the hides with that and then we soften them. And it makes just this most beautiful, wonderful material. Um, when, it's, when it's all fully softened, then we'll make a tripod and smoke it. It makes it different colors and it gives it this flavor. I mean, it gives it this, this smell like the flavor of smoked pepperoni, just beautiful stuff. We have bison out there, of course. Sometimes we'll we have to keep the herd to a certain number. If we have too many animals, it will damage the land, just like cattle. So we have to butcher a certain number or sell a certain number each year. Uh, some of those are breeding stock. Some of them we'll butcher out. We'll take the hides, make sure those get brain tanned into robes. We'll take the scrapings from the hides and process them into hide glue. We'll take the horns and process them into spoons. Uh, just like the deer, we'll process the tendons into bowstrings and the bones into pottery temper. We try to use every part of it out of respect. So what we've done so far, you know, it's, it's just a beginning. We've been out there for five years um, applying Choctaw respect and management techniques for the land, applying other techniques from restorative agriculture, trying to focus on community and traditional culture, trying to provide opportunities for people to come out and experience these things that they may not get to experience with the land in their daily lives. Through these things, we're working towards our goal, but it's just a small, small beginning. Hopefully, it's something that will be useful to other people who may be interested in doing some of the same things. Um, you know, hopefully by talking with them, we can prevent them from repeating some of the same mistakes that we've made and sort of speed things along for them if, if they're interested in doing something similar. The results from this work are, are shared in different ways. One of the ways is the Choctaw Food Book. It's a, a book that I put together over about five years, um, talking with elders, going back through historical documents, making and using pottery, growing out some of these plants, tracking down heritage seeds, collecting in the wild, all of those different things. So all of that information was put together into this book that tracks the Choctaw food way basically from the beginning up through today and then provides the information that people would need to revitalize Choctaw food at the family dinner table, whether it's an indigenous dish cooked in clay pottery off of land that you manage, or if it's something where you go to the grocery store and cook it in a modern kitchen, uh, it still has some of the same health benefits and it's got important cultural connections. We also, again, to, to share our ups and downs with this project, we also have a blog. It's www.nanawaya.com, nanawaya.com. And here we just, like I say, share some of the experiences on the land, um, share some things that we've learned, share some of the mistakes that we've made. And the idea is to try to create a conversation for people who are doing some of the same things. Maybe we can learn from them, or maybe we'd have something to share that would be useful to help speed their process along. 
So we're five years into it. You know, it's probably something we'll be doing as, as long as we're on planet Earth. But it's been a really rewarding experience. And it's been a fantastic way to feel like we're more indigenous, more connected with the land than we, we were before. So thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Ian Thompson, for being on uh, the podcast, accepting my invitation. And uh, uh, just your uh, presentation is is just it's got so many elements to it. Educational, it's emotional, it's uh, you know, it's inspirational and uh, hopeful. I mean, it's just it's a beautiful presentation. You certainly carry on the tr- the oral tradition uh, of Choctaw history very well. So I appreciate you being on the podcast today. Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, you can join me on Locals at LibreQuest.Locals.com where I'll be posting exclusive interviews, some of my music, and other things. And we can talk about whatever you want to talk about as well. For other ways to support me, you can visit LibreQuest.org. That's L-I-B-R-E-Q-U-E-S-T.org. And thank you for being a listener. Until next time, I'm Matt, and this is LibreQuest.